All right, so now let's get started and create an EC2 instance with PowerShell. Well, we're going to create nearly all of the dependencies needed for an EC2 instance. So we don't even need any kind of dependencies like, you know, VPC, Internet Gateway, Router, or anything like that. We'll go ahead and create all that for you. All right, so let's get started. All right, so the first thing we have to do is create the network stack. And to do that, we first need to create a VPC. For this demonstration, I'll be using a network of 10.0.0.0 slash 16, so a pretty big network. And then to create the VPC, we use the new EC2 VPC command using the CIDR block parameter, and we can pass that network to the new EC2 VPC command. All right, so I will go ahead and just do that. And that just creates a basic VPC, nothing too fancy there. So on 8 and 9 there, notice that I'm using the edit EC2 VPC attribute command. This isn't necessary, but what I'm doing here is I am enabling DNS support and DNS host names, which allows AWS to assign DNS names and also allow my EC2 instance on my VPC here to resolve names. So I can go ahead and just run both of those. All right, so now that I've gotten those, Go ahead and collapse this. And next, I want to do the Internet Gateway. Again, this isn't necessary, but if you need to access the EC2 instance from the Internet, you have to have an Internet Gateway, or in Windows terms, a default gateway. You need to have some kind of uh, resource out there for your EC2 instance to hit your VPC and then to go out to the Internet. And to do that, we use the new EC2 Internet Gateway command. So this is very simple. There's no parameters at all. We just kind of create one. But to assign that Internet Gateway to the VPC we just created so our EC2 instances can get to the Internet, we have to use add EC2 Internet Gateway. All right, no output there, so pretty simple there. All right, so next up, we have to create a routing table for our instance, we're going to create a default route. So even if you assign the internet gateway to your VPC, there's no way for your EC2 instances to actually get out. There needs to be a specific route. To do that, we have to create a route table and a route. So we can use the new EC2 route table command here, and we will assign it to the RT variable. And that's going to create the route table and associate with our VPC. Next up, we have to create a route inside of that route table. And you can see that I'm providing the route table ID, the gateway ID, and then the destination CIDR block, which is all zeros, which is the default route, which just has all traffic. So we're going to route all traffic from the EC2 instances connected to this VPC to our internet gateway that we just created. All right, so I'll go ahead and run these two commands to create the route table and the route. Okay, continuing on, next up, we have to create the subnet. So we created the VPC, which is a big chunk of IP addresses. Now we need to assign subnets inside of those VPCs. To do that, we first need to know the availability zone because the new EC2 subnet command has to have the availability zone. We can find the availability zones by running git EC2 availability zone. You can see there that I've got a few different available. You know, pick whichever one you like. It doesn't really matter in this, in this case. Um, and then on line 34, I'm running new EC2 subnet, providing the VPC ID that I created earlier, the CIDR block, which is a smaller network inside of that big VPC, which is 10.0.1.0 slash 24. So it's going to be 255.255.255.0. And then I am specifying the availability zone of the one that I found there. So I'll run this and I'll assign that output to SN. That gets me a subnet object that I can play with. And then even if I created the subnet, now I have to associate or register that subnet with the specific route table that I created earlier. To do that, I use the register EC2 route table, specify the route table ID. I'm using it from the output of the uh, route table that we created earlier. And then I'm using the subnet ID of the subnet that I just created. So go ahead and run that and just return the string. Nothing big there. All right, continuing on. We've now created the base network stack. There's a few other things that you can do, but this is that's pretty much the basics. Next part is we need to find the AMI to use, or the OS image. All right, so I want to create a Windows Server 2016 uh, box. You can create anything like this, but in this case, I'm just going to pick one. So I chose Windows Server 2016. You're going to need an AMI object 
And to get that, one way to do that is to use the get EC2 image by name command. And when you run that, you'll have a lot of stuff in here that will have all Windows images that you can use. So this is a good name to use to get all of your various Windows images. So because I'm going to choose Windows and I want to choose Windows Server 2016 base, that is the base one. Obviously we have Nano, Core, Container. We have a lot of different options there, but I'm just going to choose the base one. So I'll get that and assign that to my AMI variable. All right, well, once I do that, now I have the whole network stack and I have the AMI available. Now I can create my instance using new EC2 instance. I can do that by providing the image ID of the AMI that I just got. Associate public IP. This is not going to work as is. I have to actually set this to false because of the way that I'm creating it. And then the instance type, T2 micro. Unfortunately, you can't find the instance type via PowerShell, but you can go on AWS's documentation and easily find the instance type. Just type in EC2 instance types and it will give you a big list. And then I have to provide the subnet ID. So let's see if this will work. So it did work because it didn't give me an error message. All right, so now who knows how long this is gonna take. Sometimes this takes a while, especially for the, the Windows images. So now we need to monitor this. If this code were in an automation script, you wouldn't wanna just constantly check and see if this is available over and over and over again. So it's always a good idea to create a, a function to do this. So I've created a function here called wait EC2 state. And basically it just runs get EC2 instance status there on line 81 over and over and over again and just make sure that it checks a specific state. So for now, I'm just going to add this to my session. And then now I can call get EC2 instance. So when I call just get EC2 instance here, notice that it does return all of the, the instance IDs that I have uh, available in my subscription. But to narrow that down, let's see here. All right, so now we have one. And now I'm just going to pass output of that to wait EC2 instance state. And you see that I have a desired state of running. I can verify that by going over here to my instances. And let's just see, refresh this. I want to see if, what this looks like in the console. Okay, so now you can see that the instance that we just created ending in 6.9, make sure that's the right one. Yes, uh, 769. So that is the right one. Let's just say that this was still stopped. Well, let's just say that it's supposed to be, I don't know, stopped. So when I run this, when it's stopped, notice that it's just going to just sit here and hang um, for a while until it enters the running state. So that's the cool little wait EC2 instance state that I have created for you. Okay, now we can actually bring all this together into a custom function. I'm not going to go over the function in detail by any means, um, but I'm just going to hit a few minor things here. So this is the function. This will be available in GitHub with the resources. And you see here that I've embedded the wait EC2 instance state function that I have in the begin block. It's just the exact same function. This function becomes portable. I can copy and paste this and do whatever I want, and that function is still available. And inside the process block is where the real magic happens. And the difference between this and the way that I demonstrated in the code is you can see there that there's a lot of git commands. So 65, you have git ec2 vpc. Then on 85, you have git ec2 internet gateway. It's going to first check and see if each of those objects exist. And if not, then it's going to do it. So there's a lot of different get options first. It's going to get it first, then if it does it. So that gives us the opportunity to then run this over and over again and make it item potent, which essentially will account for it in different states that the, your AWS environment may be in. That the, Just that function. Feel free to devour it all you want later by just getting it downloaded. And to show you an example of how this works, let's hope this works here. Let's actually bring this in to my session this way. And then I'm um, run this. There you see that creating EC2 instance, there's an option there. A subnet has already been created and registered with VPC. So it gives you some verbose output of um, if the objects that it needs has already been created. So notice that it's already waiting for a running state. That means that it went through all that code immediately already and it entered a running state and it should have created a new VPC. So let's just confirm to make sure that that's actually true. All right, see now we have four when we had three before. So this is the VPC that it just created. So that's a really cool way to 
bring all that together and have your own custom EC2 instance if you need to add some default values to it, just to some add new functionality to it, you know, and that sort of thing. I hope you got a lot out of this video. That has been how to create an AWS EC2 instance with PowerShell. Thanks for watching.